Hello, and welcome to the second of the three-part webinar series focused on innovating the candidate experience. My name is Mihir Gandhi, and I am head of Marketplace Operations at Eightfold.ai. As a hiring manager for nearly two decades, sourcing, hiring, and retaining talent has been a central theme in my career. Managing at a hyper-growth company like Lyft, where I was the first general manager for their flagship region in Northern California, I've acutely felt the pain of hiring rapidly and hiring right. I'm thrilled how Eightfold is addressing these challenges and so much more, and today we'll talk about how that's happening. Specifically, we're diving into strategies for recruiting and talent acquisition and how AI is changing the recruiting process. We're joined by our esteemed guest, Amit Prakash. Amit is the co-founder and CTO at ThoughtSpot, and we'll have robust content to cover with regards to how he approaches AI in general, and also specifically to talent acquisition and the interview process. But first, a little bit about Eightfold. At Eightfold, we've created a talent intelligence platform for enterprises that leverages artificial intelligence to hire, engage, and nurture talent. Talent-centric applications built on this constantly learning platform enables enterprises to manage the entire life cycle from prospect to candidate to alumni. With over 100 companies uh, uh, paying customers, including Tata Communications, AdRoll, Hulu, Grand Rounds, Nutanix, and more, Eightfold has helped companies vastly improve their talent acquisition, talent diversity, and talent management capabilities. Historic, historical legacy products like ATSs, were developed to replace the process of tracking paper resumes, and as such provide pretty similar workflows. The now ubiquitous and onerous online application processes that companies require from applicants is unduly hard on both applicants and companies, replacing paper problems with digital ones. Eightfold was born in the AI era, specifically to address and solve challenges with employment in today's society. As this slide communicates, more information than ever is being communicated about jobs, about companies, and about candidates. These reside on job boards, career pages, social profiles, professional profiles like GitHub, Dribble, and more. And companies have more information than ever in their ATSs, in their HRISs, CRMs, et cetera. And of course, hiring managers have specific visions as to the skills, experiences, knowledge, and culture that they're building. But more data isn't necessarily better. It just means there's more places to find disparate information and try to cobble it together to get a more holistic view of a candidate. It's not humanly possible to take in all of these data and identify a candidate's fit, or to figure out their potential to excel in a given role, let alone their career trajectory. And then to do this across thousands of candidates and hundreds of jobs, is simply a, a superhuman task. That's where Eightfold Talent Intelligence Platform comes in. Eightfold was designed to improve the lives of candidates, recruiting, HR, hiring managers, employees, and alumni. The platform aggregates and digests these data, marrying internal data like your APS, the plethora of sourcing and recruiting tools you could be using, with externally available information to create an enriched talent repository. The Eightfold Tip platform uses these data to help surface what candidates are good at today and what they'll be ready for in their next steps in their career. This drives better talent strategy and talent execution. Once the Eightfold platform has ingested robust data from legacy and public profiles for each person, and thus created a rich profile of each candidate, the platform calibrates each role according to specific needs of the organization. The results impact the entire ecosystem. The intake process is redefined around content, an instant pipeline of highly qualified candidates is delivered to recruiters and hiring managers. The candidate experience is transformed from being do-it-yourself to let us help you. The internal referral experience is streamlined to be friendly to recruiters, employees, and candidates. And as we talked about in yesterday's webinar, the platform drives your attention through smart and targeted internal mobility. After our discussion with Amit and before our Q&A, Jason Gray, Eightfold's Director of Sales Engineering, will give us a brief demo to bring these words to light. Additionally, I'd love to have the audience participate by sending questions throughout the course of the webinar that we can then engage with Amazon during the Q&A session. I'd like to give a couple of examples of how Eightfold has helped our customers. This first example is from Hulu. Hulu is using a host of tools to assist in recruiting such as Jobbyte, LinkedIn Recruiter, agencies, job boards, and sourcing tools. 
They were receiving more applications than their team could possibly keep up with. And given their hot growth and trajectory, the volume of applicants, the number of tools they were using, the Hulu team found that highly qualified candidates were slipping through the cracks. After implementing Eightfold, which aggregated data across all these tools and sources, Hulu was able to have a single view on their entire talent network. On average, recruiters saved about four hours per day and quickly stopped using InMail because their talent pipeline was full of highly qualified candidates. At Tata Communications, they were similarly over overwhelmed with massive inbound, and hiring processes were in line with a 10K plus company that was experiencing explosive growth. Hiring managers were spending time interviewing candidates that weren't the exact right fit. With Eightfold, Tata was able to immediately rank, sort, and prioritize candidates who were the best fits for each job. Recruiters and hiring managers were able to calibrate needs in real time, driving more efficient hiring, hiring manager time use during their interviews. 50% fewer inter, uh, meetings to recalibrate on expectations for candidates, and approximately four to six hours saved per recruiter per day. Now, almost two-thirds of Tata's hires are driven by Eightfold. As I mentioned earlier, Jason will be giving the demo of the Eightfold platform before the Q&A to help bring some of these examples to light. But now, let's get into our conversation. I'm very excited to welcome our featured presenter, Amit Prakash. Amit is co-founder and CTO at ThoughtSpot and has built numerous high-performance machine learning and analytics systems. Prior to ThoughtSpot, Amit led multiple engineering teams in the Google AdSense environment. Prior to that, Ahmed was one of the early engineers on the Microsoft Bing team, where he built a web-scale graph computing system responsible for computing algorithms and capabilities like PageRank on graphs over trillions of edges. Ahmed is also a co-founder of Elements of Programming Interviews books, where he has tried to help both interviewers and interviewees better prepare for technical interviews. He received his PhD in computer engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Hook him and a Bachelor in the Technology and Electrical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology in Kanpur. I'm so excited to welcome you today, Amit. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for a great introduction. Absolutely. Um, Amit, let's, let's jump in, because I think uh, there's, there's a lot of content to dive into here. Um, you spent several years at Microsoft and at Google, and there was tremendous growth at each of those companies in your time there. Uh, you know, your teams must have grown dramatically during that time, and so you've had to hire a lot. As a hiring manager, why is hiring so hard? Yeah, so I, I think hiring is hard because everybody's realized that probably recruiting is the most important function in a company for the success of the company. If you get the right people in, um, there's nothing like it in terms of growth and success. And, and so there's a lot more demand for great quality people everywhere you go than there is supply. And so what you end up doing is essentially kind of playing money ball with your candidates because you know that the superstars for whom everything looks perfect on the resume, everybody's after them. And you can go after them and sometimes you'll win, but to really succeed, you need to find your edge. As to which dimensions that you can look at, that you can predict somebody is going to be an awesome star that not everybody else is looking at. And I think that's where most of the recruiting energy needs to go. And today, it goes so much more into the process and the sort of mundane aspect of sifting through LinkedIn profiles and resumes and uh, um, just um, inbound applications. And um, that, that's what makes it very hard because at the end of the day, when you find the right candidate, you need to spend a lot of just one on one time with them to show them your vision, why it's going to be a successful um, place for them to come. Uh, but to get to that point where you know who you're looking at is going to be a great candidate, there's so much effort that goes in, and there's such a small percentage of those efforts that actually pan out that you end up wasting a lot of very, very important um, bandwidth. Um, that if there was a better system, you you could actually concentrate on the right candidates so much more. You know, um, as you say that, um, sort of the the mental image that comes to mind is uh, a really broad funnel, uh, top of funnel that yeah. narrows uh, very quickly. But yeah. that broad top of funnel, as you describe it, is uh, sifting through hundreds, if not thousands, of profiles. 
is pretty laborious and intensive. As a co-founder of, of ThoughtSpot and as a hiring manager, can you describe your interaction or engagement throughout that top of funnel piece and how you whittle it down to the few candidates that you're, you're going after? Yeah. So as, as, um, to make it concrete, I, I can talk about a specific role that I'm right now looking for. Um, so so I'm, I'm looking for somebody who has a good um, experience with statistical techniques, data science techniques, as well as somebody who is an engineer and has exposure to machine learning. And this being a hyped up field, almost everybody is writing those buzzwords on their resume. And like, you do not cross a single resume where there's not a mention of machine learning or a mention of data science or something. And the moment you start the conversation, within five minutes you realize that they have maybe used a couple of machine learning tools and a couple of projects, but don't have nearly the depth that you want. So, so, so again, it becomes a very laborious process to um, sort of go through all these resumes that match the keywords that you're looking for, and then actually figure out who has depth in there or not. Um, does that answer yeah, it, it does. I think you know what you describe is um, the ability to quickly ascertain um, the reality of someone's experiences mm -hmm. versus um, maybe the facade of of what mm -hmm. they purport to do. Can you describe tools that you've used today or in the past that have helped streamline that top of funnel so that your time as a hiring mm -hmm. manager is more efficiently spent? on good candidates and not on the 25 extra minutes of interviews uh, that you know you're not going to proceed with? Yeah, so unfortunately, I think um, it, it, I, I wouldn't say that it's a solved problem. Um, for us, being a startup, what has happened is that since all other things are extremely noisy, the most reliable signal we have is employee reference. And so, so we've been able to find a lot of really high quality candidates through referrals. And at least a year ago, we were not even in a position to invest the human energy needed to go through all the inbound resumes and things like that. And we were ignoring that. Now we realize that there are a lot of high value candidates in there that we could have gone after and we just didn't have the manpower to go through it. Um, Referral-based hiring has been extremely helpful to us. We have an amazing team, very, very high caliber individuals. Uh, one problem with that is diversity because you tend to know people who look like you, um, who've gone to the same colleges, and then th those people also know Again, other people who look like you and went to the same colleges, so your entire workforce starts looking very much like the co-founders. And um, I would have loved for a tool that introduced us to people with diverse backgrounds and uh, gave us the confidence that we could go after them. You know, it, uh, we see something somewhat similar here at April, where when you grow from 2 to 10 to 20 and beyond, uh, each hire is incredibly important. And, uh, and impactful to the organization. Uh, that doesn't change when you're at 1,000 or 2,000 or 5,000. Uh, but certainly in that process, uh, you do lose candidates, really highly qualified candidates, uh, because the bandwidth required to actually sort through and sift through them uh, simply doesn't exist. How have you seen, uh, you know, in your experience, this evolve over time? And can you describe, you know, to a recruiter or agency, what you're looking for in a candidate yeah. to help drive this forward? Yeah, so I, I think um, I don't think we have really innovated there. We still go through the painful process of writing a job description and um, talking through what is important and what is not. But one of the things that um, one of my mentors told me at Google is that most human beings are good at looking at maybe five or eight dimensions at most, and beyond that, it gets very hard 
for a human to sort of put all the details in their mind and work through a lot of data. And that's where machines do a better job than humans um, is when there's like thousands of dimensions that you need to care about. And a machine is going to be very dumb in terms of depth, but it's going to be great in terms of breadth. Okay. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. No, no, no that, that's helpful. You know, yeah. when, you, when you say that, um, how do you, and I think your work at Bounceplot here is actually very pertinent. Yeah. You see AI and tools that drive um, those types of deeper insights mm. empowering the human element that is required yeah. to do the work. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I, I love the engineers and my team. I, I think we have an amazing team. And what I tell my recruiting team is that, like, if you can just find me exactly these kind of people, um, just send more of them, they'll be fantastic. But, but it, it's very subjective to know, like, what does these kind of people mean? Do they need to have gone to the same colleges? Do they need to have the same job experience? Do they need to have worked on the same project? And so that's where a lot of subjectivity creeps in. And sometimes I see my view of who's a higher value candidate than the other is different from the recruiting teams. And that leads to missed opportunities in terms of, like, whose scheduling will prioritize higher or uh, like if somebody was just waiting um, for a week because you were rushing through a little bunch of other candidates. You know, it's interesting you say that. Um, you mentioned the job description process and frankly how broken job descriptions are. Uh, but, but that is actually the candidate facing, you know, description of what they would be doing. The reality is you're looking for someone like someone else. Yeah. Uh, and when you say like someone else, can you help describe a little bit more about what that means? And how do you actually translate that to a recruiter that then translates that to whittling through the top funnel? Yeah, so we had a good success initially hiring engineers with you know peers of experience from Google. And that was a great profile for us. Um, like people who spend a few years at Google kind of the best place to learn sort of engineering in early years. Uh, but it, it's also very hard. Those are the people who are in very, very high demand. And um, so it's, so people like them. Again, like there's so many dimensions to look at. It could be the college. It could be the project. It could be the quality of their GitHub project. It could be... Um, that they are friends with somebody that is in my trusted network. Um, it could be that they have published something that has uh, won awards or something like that. Yeah. In, in a conference that I know high quality stuff goes through. Um, and that's where sort of once you spend a lot of time with your recruiter, they kind of get to see how you evaluate candidates and get a better and better picture over time. Yeah, you know, but the dimensions that you outline um, are almost impossible to stack, stack rank yeah. and prioritize. When you yeah. say a school like this yeah. or experiences like this or yeah. evaluate their gifts. And the reality is candidates are so diverse um, that the ability to stack rank and prioritize um, is a non-trivial task. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you, when you talk about spending a lot of time with your recruiters, can you talk a little bit about the recruiting channels that you've used, what you've seen from pros and cons of different types of recruiting channels, be it, uh, you know, um, uh, advertising channels, mm. agencies, in-house recruiters, and so on and so forth. Mm. What's the level of success across these modalities? Yeah. Uh, what are the pros and cons? And yeah. how do you spend your time investing across them? Yeah. Yeah. So... In my personal experience, nothing works like your um, team's referral. And so, so that's probably the highest priority by a factor of 10 or so. Um, beyond that, I think um, we haven't had much success with agencies and such. There are few areas where it's very sort of routine hiring process, where it's 
you don't have to look at many dimensions. Uh, you just look at a few dimensions, and you you're okay with that. Um, in those cases, we've had decent success with uh, agencies, um, but most um, so the referral network is great, but it doesn't scale well. Yeah. And so the other thing is um, th there are a lot of inbound candidates, and so. Essentially, what we've done is that we've staffed up our recruiting team so that they can go through the, all the inbound applications and figure out which ones are worth going after and which ones are not. You know, the, what you're describing is a bit of a tipping point, yeah. uh, where you're going from being um, a hunter trying to um, get people to come into your organization to being uh, an organization that has so much inbound mm -hmm. that now you need to staff up, yeah. provide the tools and processes and resources. Yeah. Uh, to whittle through that, and uh, you know, I think one of the things you mentioned earlier is uh, it, when we were talking before the webinars. There's very uh, qualified candidates who simply yeah. just fall through the cracks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When you have that massive inbound, can you talk about some of the challenges that you face with sourcing and screening mm -hmm. post tipping point when, mm -hmm. you have, when you're fielding all the inbound and actually trying to whittle through those? Yeah. Those folks who are interested in working for you. Yeah. So I, th I think. Um, like you talked about, like if you start looking at your inbound, there there is a narrow fraction that obviously looks good, and you kind of know that they're going to be good, but it's a very small fraction that's very much in demand. And most of the time, by the time you reach back, either they have moved on or they have their like crossing ten different threads. Um, so so. That's a great pool, but the success rate with that pool is not that great, right? And, and then that's where sort of creative thinking and um, sort of um, analytical approach comes in, where you find things that's not obvious to the market um, that are good predictors of success. Um, for example, there's a tiny company, not tiny actually, but a decent sized company in India called DirectEye. And over here, if you talk to people, nobody knows about them. But what we have found after hiring two, three people is that that was a fantastic training ground for a lot of great engineers a few years back. So anytime we see somebody from DirectEye, we go after them. Um, similar thing that we found is that people may not have great pedigree, but if they have participated in programming contests, particularly a few good ones, um, that tends to be a very good indicator of their performance. Like they need other aspects too, which you can test in the interview. Mm -hmm. But in general, that's a good signal to go after. It, it is so hard to communicate that um, uh, uh, to a recruiter or to an agency. You know, if this, then that, yeah. but not this. Yeah. Um, and oh, you know, we've seen some traction internally around this. Can you go? You know. Mm -hmm. But for lack of a better analogy, go fishing in, in that pond or in that part of the lake uh, where we have had success in the past and we think we have competitive advantage. If you were to take a step back from the existing modalities, can you talk about blank slate? What would an ideal sourcing process look like for you? Um, yeah, so I, I think an ideal sourcing process would exactly look like when I say, like, I have a team of five or 100 people, and I know that they are fantastic. Just find me five times more of that. Um, you, you almost don't need to say more than that. I mean, you shouldn't have to say more than that. Um, there's such rich data that already exists, um, not only in your head, but on their resumes and their publicly available information, that it should be the extent of which you um, of, of which you engage uh, at the top of funnel. Yeah. When you the, the the other thing that I will add to that is that not everybody that looks great is recruitable. So, so the other signal that I would love to be included in the sourcing process is people who are likely to. Right. And, and this could be based on how long they've been in the company or like if there's been any communication from their side to the world that they are ready to move on mm -hmm. or um, 
you know, like maybe staggering showing that is a bean indicator. It, that's the piece that's hard, but that's that's kind of once you found that looks good and you found a signal that they're looking to move, that's when things really start moving. You know, uh, those are not impossible to find, right? Uh, those data exist. They're just difficult to parse. If you take the time to look at someone's resume over a five or 10 year career span, you generally get a sense of, could they be stagnating or ready to move? It takes a lot of time, a lot of resources to do that, and frankly, a fair amount of skill. Uh, when AI is developed correctly and applied in the right way, how do you see it helping recruiting? Yeah, so like I said, I think um, where AI does a fantastic job is when there's a lot more than you know eight or ten dimensions to consider, and you have some labeled training data that lets the machine figure out what correlations are meaningful and what correlations are not meaningful. Uh, and this seems to be um, a great problem to apply AI to. And so in an ideal world, all these different signals that are available about a candidate would be processed by an AI engine and just gives you uh, you know, probability scales what is the likelihood that A, they are going to have great career potential and B, that they are likely to consider a move. A lot of that, that time is currently spent by recruiters guessing. Yeah hoping, frankly, spraying and praying. And that time is pretty valuable time that can be spent nurturing, engaging, educating candidates. Yeah. yeah. Can you talk a little bit about the importance of not just the outreach, mm -hmm. but the actual the nurturing process between finding candidates that could be a good fit yeah. and actually getting them in the front door? Yeah, yeah. So th that's the other thing that um, the, it requires significant amount of investment on the candidate side to prove to us that they are um, worth spending time on. And that's where there are others because um, you, the, the actual human part of recruiting is also very, very resource intensive. Um, I often find my engineering teams burnt out with the number of interviews that they have to do in our objective growth targets. Um, and sometimes we talk about why don't we set up a programming assignment to filter um, down the people that we interview. But then that's asking somebody to invest a chunk of their time when they don't even know whether they are interested in this opportunity or not. This is somebody needs to spend the time painting the vision for them and telling them why it's going to be a great move for their career. Um, so that, that whole process requires um, a lot of time and compassion and passion. Um, and um, if we have great signals to sort of narrow down where we spend that, um, nothing like it. Yeah, you know, there's always a balance between do I keep sourcing for top of funnel yeah. um, or do I spend time trying to help candidates learn more about the organization? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the human element associated with that that you described uh, is paramount. Yeah. Uh, but the, the tension between, you know, spending time doing one versus the other is a natural tension. Uh, and I think it's a place where where AI can help really turbocharge a recruiter's um, function yeah. um, and help them allocate their time very differently yeah. rather than 50-50 or 80-20 being 20-80 yeah. um, along those lines. I think, you know, as you think about that and, you know, as, as we continue to think about how progress is made, it's going out and finding new candidates and new candidates and new candidates, right? Just nonstop. <clears throat> but then there's this massive repository 
of candidates that have been found that maybe were lost. Yeah. Um, and or uh, came through the door at the wrong time. Yeah. And now because of the growth of an organization, they could be a great fit for that role. Yeah. How do you currently go back to that repository of people who have either indicated interest yeah. in, in your organization but maybe weren't the right fit at the right time yeah. or uh, didn't respond because they didn't know who you were and now you're at a place where people are like, huh, yeah. you know, we, should, we should be re-engaged. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, sadly the current state is that unless somebody just remembers to do that, it just doesn't happen. Um, and and th there is um, there is a lot of less potential in there that we haven't tapped in just every once in a while. It's like either one of us remembering that hey, we talked to that person, it didn't work out that time, but could work out now. Or like once in a while, we'll kind of go and look at all the new feedback and see where wherever there is potential for growth, either for them or because of the organizational growth, they they could be a fit there. Uh, but right now, it's very very sort of human centric and bottlenecked on people's mind share. <laughs> Do you have the time to go back and think about previous candidates that, who you interviewed 12 months ago or 24 months ago? I mean, you know, what you're describing is it's a highly manual process. Yeah. Um, and I ask that in jest uh, because not only do you not have time to do it, but or, man, or bandwidth or, or the mental resources, but yeah. the current process is not set up yeah. to help those candidates um, learn more about the organization at the right time. Yeah. When you think about identifying internal candidates on your team, and as you worked at places like, you know, it's very different when you're at a 10, 20, 100, even 500 person company. Yeah. You start to get to a 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 person company, uh, and you saw this at Bing, you saw this, uh, you know, at Google. How do you identify people across the organization that could be great internal fits yeah. on your team, and then also provide opportunities for people on your team? Yeah. To find other places within a larger organization yeah. for mobility. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, yeah, so I think um, where we saw both at um, Google and Microsoft was a lot of willingness on the organization's part to allow this kind of mobility, but the, the process of matching of like people wanting to move and people wanting to hire it was no different than outside recruiting. Um, maybe um, a little bit more information available, but then without too, you don't have the ability to go look at everybody's performance review, things like that. Um, so, so the process was no different than external recruiting where people who advertise or put their job descriptions and help that somebody applies and people who are interested would mostly reach out to teams where they had friends and they kind of knew that the team's doing well and progressing well and then they're also there. You, you know, as you described that, it, it sounds like, back to what you said earlier, uh, you're almost limited by the networks that, yeah. that you've already created or, or that yeah. exist. It's difficult to look beyond those. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, as we see this accelerating trend of people migrating jobs within, you know, uh, from, from 10 years to five years from now, you know, 24 months or 19 months, retention becomes incredibly important. Yeah. Uh, as you continue to grow ThoughtSpot, how do you think about retention yeah. um, versus recruiting? Yeah. You know, the, the top of, you know, inflow on the spigot versus uh, stopping the bleed on the other end. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your approach to retention versus recruiting? Yeah, so I, I think um, most people like to do two things. A, that they're making an impact and they're growing while making an impact and B, that they're being treated fairly. And so, so like, Having a great team, sort of people being treated fairly is 
kind of a no-brainer. You have to do everything you can to make sure that they're free, um, being treated fairly, right? Then the other piece is around just sort of giving people the right opportunities to grow and learn and things like that. And that's where internal mobility becomes one important factor, where um, there's some people who just love to kind of keep honing their skills in one direction and keep working, but there's some people who keep, uh, love to learn new things and try different things out and explore and figure out what works for them, which is for the rest. And so for that, we, um, we are, like, there's a little bit of tension between you don't want somebody switching teams every three months or six months, but once they have reached a certain level of maturity, we are very open to internal mobility and letting people try different things out. You know, in our, in our webinar yesterday, um, we spoke with Ashish from Tata Communications, and the way he described uh, their approach is uh, um, external recruiters have no problem reaching out to, uh, to our staff mm -hmm. trying to poach them. Um, why shouldn't we also be able to uh, use our own talent yeah. um, as a repository uh, to, um, to find growth opportunities? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, Tata is at a very different scale and stage than Spotlight is. Uh, how do you, uh, you know, right now, mm -hmm. as your organization, and as you think about the next three years or five years, identify the people that, proactively identify the people that you want to move to different parts of the organization to give those different experiences versus reactively yeah. having someone come to you and say, hey, I'm a yeah. I really want something new or yeah. different. Yeah. So what we've done is that we've been very open about the stance that once you spend the year, year and a half, we will be very open to moving. And once you reach two, two and a half year period, we actively want you to think about whether you want to stay in the team or you want to try something new, learn something new. And it's okay if you want to stay, it's okay if you want to move. But if you haven't thought about it, we will, in one on one things, we'll encourage managers to bring up those things and make sure that uh, wherever they are, it's the best place that they could be. Got it. That's, um, it's a lot, it's a lot of burden. Yeah. Not only to manage someone's existing, you know, Workflow um, and priorities, but then also think about that growth on their behalf, um, especially for junior staff who may or may not be uh, adept at proactively asking yeah. for, for new types of opportunities. Yeah. Um, I, I, I want to pause here for a minute. Um, I want to turn it over to Jason for um, for a demo. Uh, but uh, we've had a couple of great questions come in um, through the webinar. Would love to dive into that after the demo. Um, so. Hold on for just a minute, and then we'll dive back in. I think, you know, uh, I'd like to introduce at this point Jason Gray. Uh, he'll be giving us a demo of the Eightfold platform, and uh, would love to dive into it. Great. Thank you very much for your time today. I should be uh, sharing my window now so that I want to see it. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen right now. So as we go to the demo, the key takeaway here is the deep AI matching and how it, you see it throughout the platform as it relates to the candidate experience, sourcing and screening, the candidate nurturing, and internal employee mobility. And underneath all this is you know, smoothing out bias and creating more diversity as it relates to pulling in um, uh, sourcing talent, nurturing talent, and so forth. Because when we look at career pages, and you can look at any career page, they're, they're very confusing, and they're keyword search, and you search for software engineer, perhaps, and you can find hundreds and hundreds of openings at any particular company you choose. And with, um, here at 8 we really want to you know, improve that candidate experience, and we'll see that here when I click, simply go and click apply, it brings me to a window where I can upload my resume and Eightfold is going to automatically match my application to the roles that are best fit my skills or experience. And this is on the actual Eightfold site. And our customers use this. And so I go in, I grab my resume, we'll do a software engineer, and I upload this. 
and we're automatically seeing the deep matching as we're parsing the resume, applying it to all the different job descriptions and their, how they're calibrated. And we're predicting, in this case, Amy Jones, predicting what she's going to do next. This is the same experience that we see when we do referrals, employees do internally, or when an employee goes into uh, internal job postings, we'll see later in the demo. So I can see you know, full stack engineer, product management lead, senior front engineer. So two software positions that I'm interested in. Uh, I actually been, had some product management experience you know, in my previous engineering roles, and obviously it pulled that in. Uh, not obvious to me, but that's why it matched it. So these are the best positions out of all of them there uh, at Eightfold. So I'm going to apply it to both of them. And then as part of that candidate experience, we can also ask questions. Uh, so I can, you know, state them specifically or even have a text-based questions, and I can go ahead and submit my application. And then we can continue to enrich that with blog posts that relate to their position and other individuals they might know. So that makes the candidate experience better. They get email notifications and updates uh, through the Eightfold um, platform that our customers are leveraging. Now, as it relates to the sourcing and screening side of the house, when we deal with uh, recruiters and hiring managers, what do they see? And we really want to promote ease of use so that they're not spending all this time going through physical resumes, going onto job boards, trying to find individuals. Rather, they come in right in the morning and they can get right to work with the best matches available. We see this with, um, on the, as we land here, we see all the positions on my right-hand side that I'm managing. And then I see a news feed of updates on the various positions. So for software engineer, here I see there's 17 recent applicants. I see four leads that stayed in the pipeline. One of them is a top 30% senior software engineer at Airbnb. And I also see 26 new leads and two likely to respond. So we actually see some of that AI matching happening here because we're looking at the career trajectory, the skills, the titles to match the right open positions. And we also look at well, some of them have been in that position for a long time. Thus, compared to the 10 million resumes that we, um, we put print against, it says, well, there's two that are definitely looking that they're most likely would move. So that's interesting to me. And so now as a recruiter, the first position I want to work on here is the software engineer, because I'm excited as I have a whole host of new applicants, and I can see that new applicants, 167. I also have leads here. 174, 176 now, it's building constantly because it's pulling from an applicant tracking system. And those are people that might have applied in the past. But first, before I go to the people that applied in the past, I want to look at the people that are fresh and new and interested. And I can quickly, you know, if I am in a scenario around diversity where we have, a, in this case, a very skewed um, a team of men, perhaps I want to look specifically at women. I can look for those women and I can see that they're, I can see if they're at top US schools, top Canadian schools, and as I mouse over, I will I also show here the relevance. So as we're doing this matching, we're matching against skills and titles and ideal candidates, either ones that already work here at my company or perhaps that I pulled right down from a job board that, ah, oh, this person would be perfect. Um, school relevance, work, and so forth and so on. Now, I'm going to uncheck diversity women, and I'm just going to see just the top ranking here. And I see Ankur Garg, that's a net new one. And I'm going to go ahead and drill in and work down my list and see what is Ankur like. He's a lead software engineer. He's got eight years of total experience. And then we see some of the more of the matching, eight years of relevant experience to this position. So everything he's done is relevant to this position. And I look over here in the highlights. And this is where really interesting things start to bubble up. He's a top 30% senior software engineer at Snapdeal and top 40% lead as well through his different um, positions he's held there. And it's shown that what does that career growth mean? Well, it took him 6.9 years to get there compared to his peers it took 7.9. And so if I can see these top percentiles, that's going to help me hone in further on an ideal candidate. A lot of times these candidates also might be, you know, maybe he just got his PhD, he maybe had a year or two experience before that after undergrad, and now, and he's also had some internships, and he's really buffed out his resume. Well, Eightfold's gonna be able to identify that 
because we also bring in social elements in like GitHub. Do they have a lot of followers? Are they committing or um, doing repos with projects? In Stack Overflow, are they asking or answering questions? And what are they answering questions about? And that I see right here like, oh, those are major components of what we care about for this particular job opening. And as I scroll down, I can see personal info, the recruiting activity of the email sent and opened, any notes, and also other experience they have. And that experience they have, we'll see these blue boxes. These are actual um, semantic holes right from their resume that says they know MongoDB, they know SOAP, they know sales, they know finance, whatever might be that specific skill we care about. This deep AI uncovers these hidden meanings. So I, as a recruiter, don't have to go through resume after resume. I just get these top exact matches that are best for me. Now, I might want to get a bunch of these resumes over to the hiring manager, but we want to promote diversity, diversity so we'd like to mask those. And I actually can make that happen through um, sending them over. So let's just take a look at an example of Ankur here, who would be masked for the hiring manager. Now I can't see his actual name. That might suggest ethnicity. I don't see perhaps the schools he went to. And any of this can be masked so that we can make sure it's based on meritocracy of his experience or her experience in the uh, application process. The hiring manager checks a couple boxes on the people they like, sends it back to the recruiter who will then continuing continue the, the screening um, exercise. All of this would have taken a tremendous amount of time if I didn't have this deeply embedded AI algorithms taking care of me. So in my morning, I work the new applicants, I work the leads that are actually past applicants that Eightfold is also matched to this. I have my pipeline, people I've added there, and also those ones I'm actively interviewing. Great. I've done some of the phone screens. I've scheduled some face-to-face -face interviews, much more efficient than I have in the past. Now I've, I've got some, I've got a charter. We have a lot of open positions that will be upcoming in machine learning, and wouldn't it be great if I could go and send a notice out to those applicants in my applicant tracking system that, it, that are passive that I'd like to try to bubble up? And we can do that. By clicking on New Campaign here, I select the, in this case, I'm going to share a blog or web page, but it could be alumni, it could be specific opening or location. But this is literally like marketing automation embedded right into the system. And I'm going to go ahead and grab this great blog post from our site or from another area on the web that you know, suggests our thought leadership and was, would target the right people. All of a sudden, you'll notice here that my target audience went down to just under 11,000. If I take that back out again and uh, press return, I would see that number you know, further increase back up. Or I might want to say, well, this is a diversity scenario. We want to you know, target women, and it went from 10,000 to 1,800 now. And then furthermore, I might want to just select a degree like a, you know, a master's degree, and now we're down to 782 possible passive applicants in our ATS. This is all about taking your existing investments, all that money you've poured in over time trying to recruit people and hire people, and, and thus bubble those up and engage them for new campaigns. The beauty behind this and what our customers are seeing, and you're going to see here with, uh, when I drill into a particular campaign that's already run, I see the number of sent campaigns, I see the opens, and on average our customers are seeing over 50% open rates because of this deep matching of how we parse the content of that blog post that I showed and match it to the right people in my applicant tracking system. I can further see you know, what that email looked like, the audience, the deliverability of that email, and ultimately the recipients. And I can see how engaged they are, like Nicole here, two opens and 20 clicks, and also Niven and Michael. I'm going to go ahead and share these right now with the hiring manager and let them know that these look like awesome applicants from the previous uh, um, attempts to get them on board. So let's go after them again. Now all of a sudden this ability to nurture candidates and do it quickly is, is not a dream, it's an actuality. Finally, let's go take a look at the internal, mobi internal mobility. Where I am a, in the sales department 
I'm looking, are there any positions that are relevant to me? And here we go. Um, it is predicted that I'm ready to move perhaps to a director of sales role. And so I can drill into that, look at those particular jobs or job, or even look at other jobs that might be of interest to me, my applications, my referrals. So I can take a resume, upload it. There may be hundreds of openings. It doesn't matter to me because Eightfold will just automatically match them for me. Career planner, I can find mentors within my company as well as projects that might be of interest to me that I want to you know, increase my, uh, improve my skills and so forth. Now finally, I also might be an administrator in the HR department and I can come in here and look at people in our organization and come down here and say, well, who's a high attrition risk? People perhaps have been in positions too long and thus we want to make sure that we retain this talent and keep moving forward. And so I can look for those and be proactive and thanks to the matching, it's identified the, you know, their career trajectory as being an opportunity for us to improve. So as we look at this, the candidate experience, the sourcing and screening, this wonderful nurturing and employee mobility has this deep AI matching to drive tremendous efficiencies and ease of use for all those involved in the process. I'll kick it back over to me here to, to finish up. Jason, uh, thanks so much. I, I think um, you touched on some key elements that Ahmed covered um, during uh, the earlier part of the presentation in terms of challenges and opportunities. And I'd love to kick it back over to Ahmed with a couple of, of questions from the audience. Uh, you know, as we talk about um, AI, uh, just broadly as, a, as an industry, <clears throat> taking over key functions or uh, uh, key parts of, of our daily life, uh, a question that came in is, will AI replace humans? Uh, and they think that's broader than necessarily just recruiting. Uh, how do you think about AI for the threat versus an ally? Yeah, I, I think it's just a um, silly thing that plays a lot in press. I, I don't think we are anywhere close to AI being anything but an extremely powerful tool to help everybody realize their further potential. Um, I, like as as the society moves to more technology, there's always some jobs that get replaced with some other jobs and, and process some people feel the pain. It happened with automobiles, it happened with industrialization, it will happen with AI as well. But I I don't think that we are moving towards a dystopian world or anything like that. Um, for example, my company, Hotspot, what we do is that we make, um, so we enable anybody to be able to uh, interrogate their data. And this used to be not possible before um, <clears throat> for most business users. So they relied heavily on analysts or people whose job it was to pull out a report for business like that. And so there's always this question that what's going to happen to my job if we deploy hotspot? And time and again, what we have seen is that these people actually get promoted when Passport is deployed, because instead of doing the thankless job of like repeatedly just pulling reports, they end up doing higher value things and they drive more value for business and this is a case for them to get promoted to higher responsibilities. And I think similar thing is going to happen in this field as well, that um, it will just make a recruiter a lot more valuable to the organization and a lot more effective. And so they'll, they'll be able to source more candidates, close more candidates, and just be better at their job. You know, the, the human element you talked about earlier, um, and, and AI as a tool to help uh, recruiters spend more time with candidates, um, with the right candidates, yeah. right? Is that is actually even probably a way to hone that in a little bit. Um, should help, uh, tools like this should help them scale. When you think about uh, how you direct your, your recruiting team through the growth, and you talked about diversity earlier. Yeah. You know, another question that rolled in was, how do you think about AI for diversity? Does it promote bias, yeah. uh, or does it actually help with diversity? And can you talk a little about, about AI in the sense of? Yeah, so I mean, AI is like power tools, right? You, you, can, you can create beautiful things with power tools, and you can create 
a destructive force or power tools, right? So, so, so you have to know your tools and you have to direct it in the right direction. So there is a case to be made that if all that you're feeding to your AI engine is people who look a certain way or come from a certain college, they will, the AI will learn the same thing and reduce diversity. But th there are ways of addressing that. And it doesn't have to be a reason to stop using the power tools. It's interesting, as you, I think the analogy is particularly um, uh, cogent. Uh, a tool is only as good as the operator um, yeah. and then the direction that you're pointing it. When you think about recruiting and, you know, the next phase of growth for ThoughtSpot, how do you communicate some of those changes of mm -hmm. what you're looking for as you continue to grow um, from, a, from a recruiting perspective? I so, so right now, I think um, I, I'm not seeing anything else change other than the scale at which we are recruiting. Mm -hmm. And with scale, you have to change your operation, you have to change the structure with which you recruit. But the kinds of people we recruit, the quality of people we recruit, doesn't change. Um, so, so and, and the other thing that changes is at this point, we have enough of uh, name recognition and brand recognition that more and more people want to come and apply. And so, so there's a lot more candidates to go through this much larger pool. And so we need to be more efficient with that. But other than that, I'm not seeing anything. Change. And, uh, you know, as you talk about scaling operations, <laughs> you either scale with people or you help yeah. people with, with better tools. And, you know, as we, as we come to the end of, of our time here, I think you've touched on and then Frankly, gone deep on a few things that um, that are core to core challenges for for recruiters across uh, the spectrum, be it sourcing, screening, through the funnel, and then internal mobility. You sort of talked about the entire spectrum. I found this to be an incredible the learning opportunity to understand how you go from an early stage company that is fighting, scratching, flying to get the next. Uh, piece of talent to how do you now harvest uh, yeah. a lot of that coming in um, and and I'm looking forward to having future conversations on it to, uh, to track how you're managing and scaling that growth and hopefully it's not um, a linear scale with people um, and process uh, as you go from a few hundred to a few thousand to a maybe a few hundred thousand in the future um, thank you so much for your time uh, I know it's valuable well, we found it incredibly enlightening Audience, I want to thank you so much for your participation today. Um, this is the second part of a three-part webinar series. Uh, please tune in tomorrow at 10 a.m. and uh, and we'll cover the third uh, the third piece of content. And uh, I'm excited to, to continue this series. Amit, thank you again so much for your time. Yeah, thank you. This was fun conversation.